The big question: How do we keep track of all the elements? A fossil goes missing. Doctor Forrester doesn't look very happy this morning," said Felix as he poured milk on his instant oatmeal and passed the carton to Amy. She followed Felix's gaze. Doctor Forrester was standing outside the lab with Tess, gesturing and shaking her head. Matt slathered butter on a piece of toast. Julian had made himself a peanut butter sandwich, and Daria was munching an apple. The only one who wasn't eating was Crystal. Wearing her dark glasses, she silently sipped a cup of hot tea. Before breakfast, Crystal had been sitting on her cot, working on a sketch. When Amy had asked to see what she'd drawn, Crystal had pulled her sketchbook tight to her chest. Amy had wondered why Crystal would be so secretive about her drawings. Doctor Forrester finally came over, poured herself a mug of coffee, and joined them at the table. One of the little fossils from the gully seems to be missing. She lifted the cup but set it down again without taking a swallow. I could have sworn there were six fossils, but this morning there were just five on the table in the lab. Did you search the tent? Julian asked. Doctor Forrester nodded. And now Tess is searching again. The thing is, I could be mistaken about the number of fossils. There might just have been five to start with. Still, it's a bit of a mystery. At the word mystery, Amy started to tingle all over. A missing fossil? Now that was something she could get interested in. Amy thought about Inspector Ellis and his notepad. She suddenly remembered she'd tucked a small notebook inside the front pocket of her backpack just before she and Matt had left home. It would be perfect for recording any clues she might uncover regarding the missing fossil. Excuse me," she said, pushing her chair away from the table. "I need to get something from the tent, but I'll be right back." Amy sprinted to the tent and retrieved the notebook from her backpack. Along with a mechanical pencil, as she turned to leave, she spotted Crystal's sketchbook lying on her cot. Before Amy realized what she was doing, she opened the sketchbook and quickly flipped through the pages until she came to one full of detailed drawings of the little fossils from the gully. There were drawings of six different fossils, not five, so there was a fossil missing. Amy put Crystal's sketchbook back where she had found it, and hurried back to join the others. On the drive out to the dig site, Amy clutched her notebook, lost in thought. How had the fossil gone missing? Had someone taken it? And why hadn't Crystal mentioned her drawings to Doctor Forrester? You look better today, sis," Matt said, interrupting the stream of questions running through Amy's head. Yesterday you seemed pretty unhappy. Amy smiled at her brother. Today is different, she thought. Today there's a mystery to be solved. When they arrived at the dig site, Doctor Forrester suggested they spend the morning continuing their excavations. After lunch, when the afternoon sun was turning the narrow plateau into a furnace, they'd scour the gully. Maybe we'll be lucky and find more small fossil bones," she explained. Amy noticed that this plan seemed to please everyone, especially Julian. He pulled out his pick and brush and set to work before anyone else. After a while, he paused and looked over at Tess. Yesterday, you were talking about how matter can change states, but what makes one kind of matter different from another? What makes this pick different from, say, the rock or the fossil bones? Tess rocked back on her heels, wiping the sweat from her brow. Before I can explain that, we need to fill in a few background details. Remember when I said that matter was made up of small particles? Those particles are called atoms, which are so small they are invisible to the naked eye. There are more than a hundred different kinds of atoms, and each kind is called an element. 
But aren't atoms composed of even smaller particles called protons, neutrons, and electrons? Daria asked. Indeed, they are, Tess agreed. But an atom is the smallest amount of any element that still has the properties of that element. Elements, then, are the basic substances that make up all matter. Think of them as the basic ingredients of matter. All the known elements are arranged on something called the periodic table of the elements. We have one of those hanging on the wall of our science classroom this year, Crystal said. Excellent, exclaimed Tess. Then you may have noticed that each element has a name and a symbol made up of one or two letters. For example, oxygen is an element and its symbol is O. The element nitrogen's symbol is N, and the element aluminum's symbol is AL. The elements are arranged on the periodic table based on their properties and certain patterns in their atoms. Tess grabbed her rock hammer and held it up. And that brings me back to your question, Julian. The elements are often divided into two basic groups metals and non metals. The head of this hammer is mostly made up of the element iron. She flipped the hammer upside down. The wooden handle is made up mostly of non metal elements such as carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus. Felix suddenly pulled out all his digging tools and arranged them in a line on the ground. Ever notice how metal objects make a nice sound? he asked with a mischievous look on his face. He began tapping his chisel against all the other metal objects like he was playing the drums. Each one gave out a clang when he struck it. If paleontology doesn't work out for you, Felix, you might have a future as a musician, Matt joked. Then again, maybe not. Felix made a face at him. Felix is right, though, Tess broke in. That ringing sound, scientists call it resonance, is a property of metals. Being shiny is another. So is being malleable and ductile, which means that you can hammer metals into shapes and stretch them out into long, thin wires. And if you've ever seen the inside of electrical cord, you've probably noticed the metal wires inside. Another property of metals is that they are good conductors of electricity and heat. Tess picked up a piece of sandstone and set it out on a flat space beside her. Non metals, on the other hand, have very different properties. They tend to break or crumble, not bend. She hit the rock with her hammer and it shattered into pieces. They also don't conduct electricity. They are usually dull rather than shiny, and they lack that lovely resonance. She tapped her hammer on her water bottle, and it made a dull thunk. Amy noticed that Dr. Forrester had been listening to Tess, but she'd suddenly walked over to the far end of the plateau. Now she was returning in a hurry. Change in plans, everybody, she said breathlessly. There's a storm coming. She turned and pointed toward the northwest, where a line of dark clouds hugged the horizon. Even as Amy watched, the clouds seemed to expand and move closer. I'm afraid it's moving directly towards us, Dr. Forrester said, untying the lines that held the tarp over the dig site. And when it hits, we don't want to be standing up here exposed on this plateau. Why's that a problem? Crystal asked. Tess summed it up in one word, lightning. Crystal's eyes grew wide. So we're going back to camp where we'll be safe in the tents? Weren't you listening to the chemistry lesson? Felix called out as he ran over to help Dr. Forrester with the tarp. The tents have metal poles and metals conduct electricity. At home, we go into the basement when a bad storm is coming, Daria said in a tense voice. And in a way, said Dr. Forrester, stuffing the folded tarp into her backpack, that's exactly what we are going to do. Everyone, grab your gear and follow me. She led them to the spot where Felix had slid down into the gully. 
The wind was blowing much harder, and the storm now covered half the sky like a huge black curtain sweeping toward them. Yesterday, when I was walking along the gully, I spotted a shallow cave near the end of this ridge. Dr. Forrester had to shout to be heard above the rising wind. Climb down carefully, it's slippery. You can say that again, yelled Felix. Amy kept her eye on the storm as they hurried along the dry gully. Bright chains of lightning zigzagged through the steely gray clouds that were quickly approaching, and she could hear the deep rumble of thunder. By the time they reached the cave, the storm had blotted out the sun. They scrambled up the rocky hillside and stepped beneath the cave's sheltering overhang, just as the first raindrops began to fall. Move to the back, Dr. Forrester shouted above the booming thunder. They huddled together in the deepest corner as the storm struck. Rain fell in great swirling sheets. Bolts of lightning flashed and thunder crashed so loudly that Amy had to cover her ears. Gradually, the rain began to let up. The rumble of thunder grew more and more distant as the storm slowly moved off. Dr. Forrester stepped to the front of the cave and the others followed. Everything looks so much more colorful, Crystal said as the sun came out, like the rain washed it clean. It might have done a lot more than that, Dr. Forrester mused. Rain erodes these rocky ridges and loosens fossils hidden inside them. Sometimes, she paused and looked thoughtfully at the gully below, it washes fossils down off the ridges into low spots. Felix was the first to understand. You mean we might find more of those strange little fossil bones in the gully below the dig site? Dr. Forrester gave a quick nod. Exactly. So if you all don't mind getting your boots a little muddy, let's go on a fossil hunt.